Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zeph from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So this is a second video in a multiple part series on pole lathe for beginners taught by instructor Peter Wood. Now in the first video, Peter demonstrated a grounding in pole lathe itself. We looked at the lathe itself, we looked at tool selection, wood selection and the shave holes and we went into a lot of detail in order to give you a grounded for the rest of this series. If that video you haven't watched, there's a link below this video to take you to that and I'll highly encourage you to watch that because that kind of gives you the fundamentals as you watch this video here. So on this video, what we're now going to do, we're actually going to look at the preparation of the piece ready to turn on the lathe. So what Pete is going to do is take a raw piece of green timber and then process that all the way down into a cylinder. And then in the next videos that follow this series, Peter is then going to use that base to then turn multiple items, demonstrating all the techniques on the lathe itself. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. So Peter, we meet again. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so the first video, obviously, I already mentioned in the intro, we looked at a complete grounding in the art of pole lathe. We looked at the lathe, the tool selection, wood selection, etc. Now in the second video, am I right in saying that we are going to be looking at uh, preparing a piece of green wood ready for turning on the pole lathe? Yeah, that's right. We're going to start with a log and then we're going to get it onto the lathe and then it's ready, rounded, to start doing whatever you want to make. So where would you like to start first then? Okay, we're going to start with um, the tools we're using here and getting a larger log to, a, to the right size. You could start with a branch wood and then you can get rid of all of this work, but we're going to start with a bigger log um, because I like to get rid of the pith, which is the weakest part, and use the strongest bit which is there. So we've got a nice piece of ash to show you. Again, it's quickly grown, smooth bark. We've got a bit of a knot down here and it's not quite a circle but other than that it's a pretty good piece of wood um, and what we need to do is cleave it and split it down to the right size uh, and for that what we need is what well, I use an axe um, it's a simple felling axe found very cheaply from the boot fair um, I think it's a braids number two and we're going to place this on the wood now the basic rule of thumb for cleaving is split equal masses on both sides. So we're going to split in half down the middle and then we're going to split in half again. And we can keep on splitting in half and then go tangentially and then radially and keep on going to whatever size you want. But the basic premise is equal masses, half and half, then half and half, and so that the split doesn't run off. Okay. So we've got an axe and then we want a mallet. It's hard to do the first split, so you want something a bit heavy. Just your basic club. It's a knotty old piece of wood with a handle brought down to the size that works. Think about your health and safety. If this feels a bit too heavy, then make yourself a smaller one. It's easier and better and safer for you to work with the appropriate size mallet. If it's too heavy, you're out of control. So make something slightly smaller. So I'm going to place the axe on the work. I'm placing up to the pith, but not across the pith. It's the way I like to do it. And notice I'm perpendicular to the axe. That means that when I hit the axe, and if it pops open, it flies out that way and doesn't go straight into me. You don't want to be standing here and splitting the wood. Okay. So we're holding it there. We lift up the mallet and give it a whack. And you can see, let's turn it around, it's starting to split down. And bring it back. A whack. Keep on whacking. And there we go. It should open up. And there you can see some lovely straight grained ash. So now we want to make it a bit smaller. So we're going to split it in half again. And open it goes. 
And if you wanted it a little bit smaller, let's just do one more split. Put that on there. Down you go. And that's a nice size billet. So with the billet in hand, what's the next part of the process? Next part of the process is to try and get it rounder or closer to a cylinder. So we're going to use the axe or the side axe to take the corners off. And we've got the billet, we've got the chopping block and we've got the side axe. I'm left handed, I'm using a left handed side axe which is flat down one side, just one bevel and it's got a cranked handle. If you haven't got a side axe, don't worry, just use a splitting axe, something nice and sharp that you can just use to take the corners off. I should say, before we start doing any of this, we need to warm our body up. So get your wrists moving a little bit, move your arms a little bit. You should do it without the axe in your hand. Keep on moving until your muscles are nice and warm because you can injure yourself when you're doing this work. It's physical, if you're not used to doing it, you, need to, you, you can injure yourself, your muscles won't be used to it, so warm up those muscles. Um, you'll notice the chopping block is basically a lump of wood with three legs put in. You want the chopping block to be the right height for you. So ideally one where you've got a nice straight back and you can just let your ax come up and drop down again. When I'm working and producing items, I'll have three or four different chopping blocks of different heights. So that if I'm working on a longer piece, I can move it along and work it up here and I've still got a straight back. Next thing, stand with a nice wide stance and just the one side of your chopping block. Um, if you miss the chopping block, you want to go down the side of your body, not be standing in front and going into yourself. Um, the next little bit is keep a loose wrist so that when you let your axe drop down, you are holding the axe, but just lightly. So we're using the weight of the axe to throw into the wood. I'm letting the axe go straight up and down. I don't want to come in this way. When I come in this way, I can feel the weight of the axe in my hand. And so all that power is in my hand rather than in the hit. If I'm just letting it drop down, then all the weight goes in to the hit and the cut. And what I'm doing is I'm just taking the corners off. So I'm turning it around, I'm angling my piece of wood to get the correct cut. If my piece of wood is too high up, too vertical, it misses. If it's too much of an angle, it goes in, but it doesn't cut correctly. Or I can bring it at the right angle, and you can hear it cuts just right. What you don't want to do is have a solid hand like this because when you've got a solid hand like this, all the force goes up your tendons and really hurts your elbow. So be careful when you're doing this. So we're taking the corners off and we're trying to get a pentagon, a hexagon, an octagon, something that is reasonably close to a cylinder. Now notice, I've done about half the work. Um, never ever have your ax above your hand because you end up just taking the tip of your finger off or going through a tendon. So just work the first half or just a little bit more and then when you're ready for the top half, turn it round and then work the next half. Bring it down. And all the while, I'm looking to see how straight a billet I've got. This has got a slight problem in that it's got a bit of a curve. So I'm trying to take that curve out. Because we're putting this piece of wood onto the lathe, we want it to be as straight as possible and as close to a cylinder as possible. So we might, at the bottom, taper in this side to take into account the curve on that side. And is it also important to make sure you have no pith? Um... Uh, if you're using cleft timber, the pith is the weakest part. There's no strength in it, so we get rid of the tip. Um, it sort of naturally does that when you're cleaving and bringing it down to a cylinder. 
there we go. And then when you're finished, bury your axe in the chopping block to keep it nice and safe or put a nice cover on. One other little tip, when you've got your chopping blocks, cover them up when you finish using them. If it's a dry day, dust will blow up and go into the top of your chopping block and that dust is an abrasive. So when you put your ax into the top of the chopping block, it starts creating little um, chips in your blade. So look after your chopping block and that will look after your ax. So with the axe work done, what's the next part of the process? Okay, the next part of the process, Zed, is to round the billet closer to a cylinder. Okay, so we've got rough corners. I think it's six-sided, so it's a hexagon at the end. And we want to get rid of those facets so that it's closer to a cylinder. And to do that, we'll sit on the shaving horse and we'll use the draw knife um, to take the billets off. So. Hold it in your um, shaving horse. You can adjust the shaving horse depending on the size of your work. So we can turn that around. If it's bigger, that gives you more space. If it's a bit smaller, bring it up. We can push it further forward. And with this one, if I turn it back that way, I get a bit more grip. There we go. And now we're ready to go. I tend to use the draw knife with the bevel side up and the flat side down. Um, it tends to come along quite nice and straight, um, but I have sharpened this draw knife specially so that there's a slight knife edge on that side. It's not dead flat. That gives you a little bit of adjustment when you're pulling the draw knife towards you. Now, when you're first using a draw knife, get your back nice and straight, think about your body and how it works. Use your back a bit in the pulling and your arms a bit in the pulling, and just pull it back without taking any shavings off. Now you see I'm pulling it straight back and I'm just cutting in one, one spot. What we want to do, I'm left-handed so I lead with my left hand, is put it at a slight angle. Start from one side and then draw it across, just slowly. I'll show you that again so you get a nice slicing cut. Rather than just going straight back. Try your best not to do lots of little cuts. One long straight pull, but angle it and just draw it across. Like you would do with a carving knife when you're cutting a tomato in the kitchen. Slice it across rather than pushing straight down. Now, when you're ready to start cutting, start pulling back and it's not cutting. So then we angle our wrists slightly. The more you angle the wrists, the more of a cut you take off. So we're gonna start off not taking anything and I'm going to angle it back a little bit and I'm just beginning to take a little cut off. There we go and I'm angling it and I'm taking the high spots off. See I'm slicing it across rather than coming straight back like this and then keep turning it round. Now the nice thing about the shaving horse is you can keep moving this nice and quickly so you can just work in that plane with your draw knife. It'll feel a bit jumpy to start off with because you have got the axe marks but once you've got past the axe marks you can really crack on. chosen myself a particularly knotty piece of wood, which was a less of a good idea, but it gives you an idea of the sort of word wood you can work. Now you can see I'm working the first half, two thirds, and if you look, it should be relatively close to a cylinder. Once I've done the first half, I can turn it round and then do the next half to match. Because we had a bit of a curve in this piece of wood, I'm going to be tapering this side to counteract the effect of that curve in the wood. I'll show you that in a minute. And why is that important to do? When you are on the lathe, if the wood has got a curve in, then that gives you more work, work to do on the lathe. Now you want it as straight as possible along this way. got that horrible knot there, so we take a little bit off. There we go. 
if it gets difficult to work, take less off. So it's quite difficult to take a large amount off the wood. So just take little cuts and it works a lot better. So I'm looking down the wood now and I'm trying to make sure it's dead straight going along that way, dead straight going along that way. It doesn't matter that I've got a taper, but if you can see, it's got a slight curve that way. So I'm gonna take a bit more off of this side and nothing off of that side. So this side will then match that side. The great thing about the draw knife is, as well as taking large amounts off, you can take really quite delicate cuts off. And get a beautiful finish without even going onto the lathe. But we're gonna show the lathe, so I might as well get it down. There we go, so that should be A reasonable cylinder, ready to put onto the lathe. So Pete, what's the next step in the process? Okay, the next step is really important, and that's getting the billet from the draw knife stage to a rounded piece of wood ready to start shaping. And that's where I think we'll stop for a second. So I'm gonna show you how to put the billet onto the lathe, and then how to get it down to a cylinder. So first things first, we've got our poppets and we need to adjust it for length. So your handy billet that you just spent hours shaping makes a really good mallet. And you can knock the wedge out, push it out, get it to the right point and knock the wedges back in again. Try and make it nice and secure. The next thing we want to do is put the centers in. Now people do this different ways. What I do, you, you could make a a hole at either end with what's known as a gimlet. But what I do is I place the billet onto the center. Now I'm pushing that way, I'm putting pressure that way. So all the time I'm putting pressure that way, then I'm using my left hand to hold on, still putting pressure to my left, and then I've got that finger that gives me a nice bit of control. And then I can wind the Center out. I can wind it back in again to where I think it's going to be the center. And I'm just pinching up a little bit. Now I can turn it. And you may notice it's a little bit off center. Honestly, I've done that on purpose. So now it goes up and down and I can adjust it. So I can wind it back out, bring it up a little bit, give it another go. Ooh, that's not too bad, but it bounces up and down a little bit there. So I want to wind up just a tad more. And then we'll see, and that looks nicely centered. It's okay. Once we've got to that point, we can then wind it in a few turns and that will make a big hole and then wind it back out again. Okay. And you can see on this side, we've got three holes where I've adjusted it. If I make a big hole to start off with, I can't micro adjust it. So you start off with small holes and then once you're dead certain that it's perfectly centered, then wind it in and make a bigger hole. Okay, next bit, we want to dab a little bit of oil at either end on the centers. That really helps lubricate it and makes it spin nice and easy. Next thing, grab your string with your piece of work. So that means you've got work string lathe. What you don't want to do is grab your string and wrap it around. The reason being, as you push it down, the wood turns away from me. And so I don't want that to happen. So we grab the string with our piece of work, wrap it around once. Now if you wrap it around just once with this type of string, it slips a little bit. So you'll lose a bit of power. So we'll wrap it around a second time. And then we can put it back in the centers, one way and the other way. And we want to pinch it just tight enough so that it doesn't fly off, but not so tight that it, that it doesn't go round. And then we can give it a try, push up and down. There's a bit too much tension on here, so we're gonna take one of those turns off 
and that is just about right. Now, you can hear that the tool rest is bashing against the work. So we're gonna grab our peg and just put the peg in there. And there we go, we're ready to go. Okay, so now we need the um, tools. So what the tool we're gonna to use is the gouge. Okay, the big gouge. Uh, again, I'm left-handed, so I'm gonna hold the end of the chisel with my dominant hand, with my left hand. If you're right-handed, work like that. If you're left-handed, work like that. My other hand, that part of my hand, is gonna rest on the tool rest. That gives you a positive feel on the tool rest, and then I can hold the chisel with my right hand. So this back hand is gonna push it forward and back and get the right angle, and this makes it nice and secure. If the treadle is in the wrong place for your feet, just move the treadle until it feels quite comfortable. Okay. Try and get a nice push all the way up and down. What you don't want to do is just do little pushes. Okay, and what you don't want to do is come so far up that the string goes loose. So just keep a nice bit of tension and away you go. Okay. Next little bit, hold your chisel so it's just rubbing on the work. And I'm going to bring the chisel back like that. So it's still resting on the tool rest and you'll get to point, there you go, it's just starting to cut. And that's all you need to take off. If you try and push your chisel on harder, it digs in and it's really difficult. So honestly, the quickest way of roughing out the wood is to take small amounts off. Let me show you what I mean. If I tread up and down slowly, you can see most of the time my chisel is well away from the work and just catches the top layers of the wood. And so we're going to work all the way along. That's getting a bit close to the string because you'll notice the string goes from side to side. So I'm going to come back a little bit. Just taking a tiny little bit off each time. When we get to the end, angle your chisel just slightly off the end. You don't want to come this way because that will dig in and then that will fly off. So we take a little bit off, just tiny little bits off. You can hear, let's move my hand out of the way just so you can see what's happening. You can hear the shavings are getting a bit longer but this is still rough so I'm going to move the string across and take some little bits off here. I find it's better to take a little bit off all the way along and then come all the way back. Getting a bit closer to the string, so we'll move the string out of the way. And then along we come this way. And you can hear it's getting closer to a cylinder all the time, but still be nice and gentle. If you start trying to push too hard, it will start jumping. I will say this portion of getting the billet ready is the hardest bit you do. Because it's trying to bash the wood out of the way, it's trying to bash the chisel out of the way, move the string out of the way. You can see the shavings are getting a bit longer. Still take it nice and easy. And then at some point, here we go, you can hear the difference in the sound. You start getting a consistent sound. Let's go about that way, there you go. Move the string out of the way, let's get that little bit done. can really hear the difference in the turning. This is still a little bit rough. Come off the end. And I'll slow it right down. One last thing. You want your chisel to be as low an angle as possible. OK, 
Okay, so it's just skimming across the top. If the angle of your chisel is higher, it scrapes and doesn't work well. So you bring your back hand down until it's just cutting. And one final thing, have a listen to the sound the chisel is making. Half the time it's sounding and the other half the time it's silent. That's because I'm going on, off, on, off, on, off. Every time my foot comes up, I take the chisel off. But go forward and back rather than up and down. If you go up and down, you change the angle of your cut every time. So keep the angle consistent and that will make your turning much easier. Lovely. So are you happy with where we're at now then with this piece? It, it's a good point now because at every point along the billet, it's now a cylinder. That means it's a perfect point to start making some projects. Um, this is the process that you will do to start every project that we do from now on. So it's getting the wood from the log to the billet that's been turned round and is ready to start shaping. So with the next few videos, the individual projects we're going to work on, this is basically the starting point for all of them. This is the starting point from all of them. Your billet may be bigger, smaller, shorter, longer, but you've done the same process, starting with a log, cleaving, axing, draw knifing and roughing out to this stage, and then it's ready to start shaping. Well, I appreciate that, Peter. Thank you. So there you go, my friends. That is a wrap for the second video in this pole lathe series. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, the first video I will link to down below, where Peter Wood has obviously given you a complete grounding for this entire series. So please do go check that out if you haven't done so already. In the next few videos, we're going to be using this same starting point to then turn individual items uh, and Peter will, will walk you through step by step on how to make those. Once again, to view those, check the links below and that will take you to that uh, video in the series. Also, one final thing I will remind you is something I mentioned in the very first video, and that is Peter Wood teaches here full time. He runs courses throughout the year. He does some amazing courses. He's renowned for his seven day chain making courses. And Peter Wood has been doing this for a very, very long time and is very well respected within the Greenwood working fraternity. So it will mean the world to me as a thank you to him for allowing me to come here and document this so I can share this with you guys. And that is, please do go check out his website, his Instagram, and his Facebook. The links for all those three will be down below. On his website, he has a lot more information about all the different things that he has going on. He also has an email newsletter where he gives you live updates of the demos that he's running and new courses that he's putting on throughout the year. So when you do visit his website, uh, please do go join his email newsletter and he could keep you updated that way. Also on Instagram and Facebook, he's very active. He's posting on a daily basis so you can get a real insight into all the things that are going on here, all the classes, all the products that he's making, etc. So once again, please do go check that out. So I look forward to seeing you on the video. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. This is Zeph from Zell Outdoors. Peace out. Mm -hmm.